a heads up if you were with me on Rosh Hashanah, you heard this, although I did make some changes and added a section for Yom Kippur, so it won't be totally repetitious, but you've heard the expression hiding in plain sight. I've used it, annoyed, as someone in my family can't find the ketchup, which is hiding how dare it on the top shelf smack dab in the middle of the refrigerator. Hiding in plain sight is how most of us see, or more, accu more accurately, don't see, the biggest threat to the world as we know it. It's not immigration, although it is the news almost every day, or the pervasiveness of gun violence, such that no place is safe and that we have six guards here this morning. Nor is it systemic racism and implicit bias, which are both still ubiquitous. The biggest threat to the world is not anti-Semitism, although it is serious, it is rising, it is abhorrent, frightening. There was another murder this, this on Yom Kippur in Germany, in your synagogue. And it hits home for us in Pittsburgh, for sure. Our pro programming teams and committees are committed to studying all of these issues that I just mentioned this year. Anyone and everyone, regardless of your positions you take, are invited to join in these discussions. This morning I feel called to respond to what many scientists, activists, and many of us consider the greatest threat to our world, the one hidden in plain sight, and the one that intersects with almost every other issue I mentioned above, and that is climate change. About this, my son Asher says, thanks, baby boomers. He's not wrong. My Rosh Hashanah version of this sermon reflected on the creation stories in the Torah against the backdrop of what science has revealed about the Earth's climate, and considered the words of young people all over the world who are telling us with urgency and passion that our house is on fire. We committed to one action that would lessen our own impact on the fragile and vulnerable earth. And this morning we'll do all that as well. But I'd like to add one element drawn from Jonah, which is the traditional reading for the afternoon of Yom Kippur. And the element that Jonah brings us is hope. We begin with a look at the Jewish wisdom around our role as human beings in the creation stories. In the section we read on Rosh Hashanah morning from Genesis chapter 1, Human beings are the capstone of creation, created in God's image. God tells us that we are to rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, the whole earth, and all the creeping things that creep on earth. A verse later, God tells us, be fertile and increase, fill the earth and master it, and rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the living things that creep on earth. In this narrative, God instructs us to master the earth. Some translations use subdue. In either case, we are separate from, could mean above, creation. Although those instructions seem to give us license to degrade the earth or otherwise do as we will with it, a midrash challenges that message. Rabbi Hanina said, if the human being merits it, then God says, have dominion. While if we do not merit, then God says, we will be taken down. This teaching makes an important point. Dominion of the world is not a given. It's conditional. To Jewish, Jewish tradition teaches that we, have the, we only have the merit to opportunity to rule the earth, the merit to op, merit, we only merit the opportunity to rule the earth if we behave righteously. This includes the spiritual discipline to use our resources wisely and subdue rule, master, with a sense of moral responsibility. 
The second creation story in Genesis chapter 2 contains the creation, the, the version featuring Adam, Eve, and the Garden of Eden. In this version, human beings are created after all the plants and animals, and we are fashioned from the dust of the earth, just like everyone else. In contrast to the first creation story, here humans are made of the same stuff as animals and plants, and we are not given dominion over anything. Rather, and this is critical, our job is la'ovda l'shomra, commonly translated to till and to tend the earth. I have never seen it translated this way, but what if ovda, which has the same root as avoda or service, eved, slave, as in sacred service, was meant to convey the idea that taking care of the earth is sacred work. Then the phrase becomes to serve and protect, and it changes everything. The midrash connects the stewardship, this midrash connects the stewardship of the earth with human righteousness and supports this to serve and protect idea. God showed Adam around the Garden of Eden and said, look at my works, see how beautiful they are, how excellent. For your sake I created them all. See to it that you do not spoil and destroy my world, for if you do, there will be no one else to repair it. Most of us would agree that while charged with both mastering and serving and protecting the earth, we have done more mastering than protecting. Our lack of righteousness has led to rising temperatures and sea levels, melting ice, plastic filling our oceans, climate-related migration. The list goes on and on. We have scorched and we have spoiled the world. But have we destroyed it? No, not yet. Can it be repaired? Well, that depends. So far, it's just an emergency. By 2030, some say 2040, we will have created a climate catastrophe. According to the IPCC Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we are fewer than 12 years away from not being able to undo our mistakes. In that time, unprecedented changes in all aspects of society need to take place including a reduction of our carbon emissions by at least 50%. It is worse, much worse than you think, warns David Wallace Wells in his book, The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming. I, I just can't even imagine writing a book called The Uninhabitable Earth. He and others predict that along with the rise in temperature, we will experience mass extinctions of plants and animals, a sharp increase in wildfires, fires, extreme weather, hurricanes, drought, and heat waves, a rise in warfare, mass migrations, sunken and lost coastal cities, and deadly air quality. Public health crises, mental and physical both, will increase dramatically. Think of the creation story, but backwards. Instead of the creation of the earth and its inhabitants, we are looking at the destruction of the Earth and its inhabitants. In a comet that sends chills down the spine, Wallace Wells observes, every aspect of life as we know it on this planet is changing already. The planet is already hotter than it's ever been in all of human history, and it will surely change more, which means that everything we know about human life and human civilization grew up under conditions that no longer preside and we're living in a different enough environment, it may even be better to think already that we're living on a different planet. And given where we're headed, things are going to change even faster, even more dramatically in the decades ahead. We can't live on a different planet. There is no other planet. This one, Earth, is the one we were given to work and to protect. The signs of the young people at the worldwide September 20th climate strikes were right on. There is no planet B. Given our roles as caretakers of the Earth, we must not stand idly by while our planet bleeds. What's next? Given the urgency of the problem, what's now? Let's turn our attention to two young women, one of whom you most likely know about, Greta Thunberg, 
the 16-year-old Swedish advocate for our planet, and one you most likely have not yet heard of, Ali Sarusi. Greta Thunberg began her strikes in 2018 by protesting climate change in front of the Swedish parliament. You probably saw a picture of her sitting all by herself, this tiny little person in front of the Swedish parliament instead of attending school on Friday. Her actions soon sparked a movement and led young people around the world to strike from school on Friday to demand action. On September 20th, 20th of this year, four million people from one person in 2018 to four million people, mainly young people, but adults as well, gathered to call attention to the emergency. Their message, we want a future. Ali Sarusi, 27 years old, was profiled as part of the Covering Climate Now Global News Initiative as one of a growing chorus of people opting to forego having children because they are worried about the kind of world they'll inherit. She reflected, as I'm picturing it now, I worry that kind of on the minor end of things that if I had a kid, it would be hard in the summer. Maybe there would be too much smoke from wildfires. I keep saying wildflowers. From wildfires, which was an issue in Seattle last summer. And then that would maybe decrease their quality of life. That's kind of the smaller thing I think about. And then I think about, what if there were wars? What if we're fighting wars for resources? That's really scary, and I wouldn't have to, and I would have to find my child shelter because of climate change. So she's not gonna have kids. This generation is panicking, and they want all of us to panic. They want us to act as if our house is on fire because it is. Franklin Fire, author and staff writer for The Atlantic, suggests that anxiety is the mature response. To protect our children, he urges, we need to embrace their despair. That is, we need to own this crisis. All of us need to own this crisis. It is not acceptable, it is not ethical, and it is no longer an option to let the kids deal with the crisis. A sign at the September 20th, 20th climate strike in Los Angeles puts us in our places. The kids said, if you were smarter, we'd be in school. Is it too late now? No, not yet. Our website will soon link resources, books and articles, websites, and lists of things we as individuals, families, and small groups can do to lessen our own negative impact on the Earth's climate. But the real answer is that all 10 countries in the top 10 global emitters of carbon dioxide must respond to the crisis with action. Many of you know this, but for some it will be a surprise to learn that China is the top emitter of carbon dioxide, and the United States is second. However, because of our glutinous use of fossil fuels, the per capita rate in the United States is highest, more than twice of that of number two China. So we switch places per capita. Our governments must change policies and pass stricter legislation. Co co corporations must change the way they do business. And every single person, every single person must radically and permanently change the way we do things. There are ways that we can be involved politically, each in our own way. Our focus this morning is on you and me. Jonathan Safran Foyer, in a book called We Are the Weather, Saving the Planet, begins at breakfast, describes sacrifices Americans willingly made during World War II, acknowledging that the war would not have been won without home front efforts. Ordinary people sacrificing their own needs or comfort to support the greater cause. It's our turn now. We must commit to steadfastly undertake the sacred and essential task of serving and protecting the earth, even if we are uncomfortable sometimes and inconvenienced once in a while. And this is key, even though there, even though there is no guarantee we can still prevent climate change from escalating into a climate catastrophe. There is no guarantee, but there is hope. And it is for hope that we turn our attention to the Jonah story. First, the world's shortest overview of the book of Jonah. I checked. It's the shortest. Jonah is sent by God to warn the people of Nineveh, who were cruel and wicked, that God was going to judge them. Rather than obey, Jonah fled in the opposite direction, boarding a ship bound for the city of Tarshish. God caused a great storm that threatens the safety of the ship and everyone on board. 
Jonah disappears into the bottom of the ship and goes to sleep in the middle of the storm. The captain cries out to Jonah, how can you be sleeping so soundly? Up, call upon your God. Ulai, maybe God will be kind to us and we will not perish. When the others find him, Jonah insists that the storm was his fault and tells the men to throw him overboard. As soon as they do, the sea stops churning. God provides a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and he remains in the belly of the fish for three days and nights. After three days, Jonah repents and agrees to obey God, so the fish releases Jonah onto dry land. Jonah pronounces God's judgment upon Nineveh. The people repent, fasting and praying, so God spares the city. There is actually more to the story, but it takes us in another direction, and it wouldn't be the world's shortest version if I put it in there, so we're going to end there. So from this story, there are several obvious messages for us. Number one, we are not Ninevites. Yet on this morning of Yom Kippur, we must add to our list of sins, we have desecrated, we have exploited, we have ravaged our planet. Number two, we can't be asleep while the storms rage, while the fires burn, while the sea levels rise, while the air fills with pollution. Number three. Change is possible, and change requires commitment. Although the original text does not specify the type of sinners they are, the Ninevites are identified in the Midrash as a violent and warning, warring people. And number four, knowing how hard it is for us to change even simple mistakes, I will admit to forgetting my reusable shopping bags now and again. Imagine how hard it was for the Ninevites to give up their evil ways. But after resolute tshuva, after prayer and fasting, sackcloth and ashes, they do manage to change. Rabbi Avi Strasberg teaches a more nuanced lesson that is enormously and elegantly helpful with respect to our climate predicament. Rabbi Strasberg calls our attention to the words of the captain to Jonah. Get up, call out to your God. Ulai, maybe God will notice us and we won't perish. She notes that the captain doesn't, he can't promise Jonah that everything will be okay. But the captain says, Ulai, maybe. It's possible that we'll be saved. It's possible that everything will be okay. The captain says, Ulai, maybe. Maybe God will take notice. Maybe we will be saved, but this giving in to despair, this allowing oneself to be paralyzed, sleeping on the bottom of a boat while the world around us falls apart, that is unacceptable. We've got to choose hope. We've got to believe in the maybe. Yom Kippur is all about hope. At the end of the day, that is when Yom Kippur ends, we believe that maybe we can change, that maybe next year we won't be asking for forgiveness for the same things we ask for this year. And just maybe we can stop the destruction of our planet before it is too late. Twelve years. I know that many of you are already committed to the environment. The Earth thanks you and encourages you to continue recycling, to continue reusing, and to keep avoiding single-use plastic. As a next step, please go to our website this week or next week and commit to one change. For my first step, I am pledging to not drive at all one day a week. On Shabbat, I will walk to and from services. And my mother was here and she read this and she said, oh no, there's a giant hill. You'll be so, you'll be, what happens in the ice and the snow? And I said, I'll be fine. <laughs> I've also purchased and have begun to use only reusable non-plastic produce and food storage bags. And they're working out pretty well. I'm excited to hear about changes you will make to serve and protect the planet. I'm going to try to make the website so we can share ideas and inspire one another on that website. For that, I'll probably look to my wonderful assistant over there, Olivia. I invite you to hold two truths in your hands and hearts at this time. The situation with our Earth is critical, and the need for change is urgent. If Greta Thunberg knew about Hillel the Elder, there is no doubt she would be holding a sign that reads, if not now, when? And at the same time, it is also true that there is still hope that we can do this together.
Shana Tova.